Good afternoon. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Julia, uh, for inviting me and organizing this uh, winter school. I will keep a particularly vivid memory of this school. <laughs> <laughs> and so my mission today is to tell you a little bit about developmental dyslexia. So the title is a heavy program in itself, Genes to Brain to Reading. That's a lot. We'll probably will not cover all that much, but it doesn't matter too much. The, the, the main point is to fo focus, uh, fo foster discussion, and, uh, and there will be some discussion. Um, and um, so this is the general, uh, the general graphical representation that we use to, um, to specify theoretical models of the causes of dyslexia. And uh, it's not a particular theory of dyslexia, it's just a way of representing hypotheses by making sure that you distinguish different levels of explanation. Okay, so at the bottom you have the behavioral level. Uh, which is the, the level at which the symptoms are observed, the behavioral symptoms. So in the case of dyslexia, it's that these are children who have difficulty learning to read. Uh, and this difficulty is not uh, explained by uh, low intellectual disability, poor education, uh, poor environment, and so on, or deafness, or whatever you might imagine. So it's an unexpected um, reading disability. So these are basically the, the, the diagnostic criteria. And of course, we try to explain uh, the causes of this uh, disability, uh, most proximally by postulating cognitive deficits uh, and by testing those hypotheses, and uh, more distally by uh, postulating hypotheses about uh, differences at the brain level. And you may distinguish differences in terms of brain function and in terms of uh, brain structure and ultimately uh, genetic differences and also potentially differences in the environment. The environment is there as a, as a transversal uh, uh, concept because it may interact with other factors at either uh, biological or cognitive levels. Okay, uh, so this is the, the general framework and uh, potentially we could discuss uh, hypotheses and data at the cognitive, at the brain function, brain structure or uh, genetic levels. And uh, primarily, I, I will focus uh, today uh, at the brain structural level. Uh, but first, I, I will explain uh, just a little the, the, the cognitive level. Uh, maybe just one word to say that th there are several potential reasons why one might be interested in studying dyslexia. Of course, for many people, the main motivation is to try and help dyslexic children, and that's a perfectly respectable uh, motivation. But of course, uh, there, there are also other possible motivations. Uh, for me, the main interest of dyslexia is that it's, it's one way uh, to highlight uh, causal relationships between genetic variations, brain variations, and cognitive variations. And so it's, it's uh, so one phenomenon that may teach us something about the biological basis of language just uh, in the same way as basically every disorder, every disease, every pathology uh, uh, highlights such causal changes and, and, and uh, acts as a window uh, through which we can look to see things that we might not see otherwise in normal functioning and normal development. Okay, so maybe just one word about uh, what's going on at the cognitive level, although I do not want to spend too much time on this, unless you are really very deeply interested and you ask questions and then, then we can discuss if you like. But so just to let you know that the main hypothesis about a cognitive deficit in dyslexia, the one that's most widely accepted and that is almost certainly true of at least a majority of dyslexic children, is that of, of a phonological deficit. So I think by now you should have an idea of what phonology is. Um, and so here, by phonological deficit, people typically mean uh, a, a difficulty with not necessarily the representation of the speech sounds of the native language, but the, potentially the processing of those speech sounds in certain instances, or uh, most probably the ability to consciously manipulate those speech sounds to, uh, to use them uh, in working memory, to pay attention to them, um, and, uh, and you may begin to see the connection with learning to read, that when the child learns to read, the, one of the first steps is to learn the correspondences between letters and speech sounds. Okay, we talk about 
correspondences between graphemes and phonemes in our jargon. Um, and so you can easily understand that if a child has uh, difficulty understanding what uh, units speech is made of and paying attention to those units and remembering them, and well, it, they, it's going to be more difficult to learn these associations between graphemes and phonemes. And that's only the beginning of an explanation of the, of the reading disability through the phonological deficit. If you're interested, we can discuss. There's a lot more evidence. There is also evidence that some dyslexic children do not have a phonological deficit, and it's a big debate exactly what they have. And of course, there are some visual hypotheses, uh, for example. Um, and it's almost certain that some dyslexics have, have some kind of visual or visual attentional deficits, although it's also fair to say that uh, the, the, the data in support of those hypotheses is much less strong than uh, for the phonological deficit. But so keep in mind that whenever we study a group of dyslexic individuals, um, we do not necessarily know uh, ve very uh, precisely their cognitive characteristics, but if we sample the population randomly, we are likely to obtain a majority of individuals who have a phonological deficit and a minority who don't. And then whatever we study at the brain or at the genetic or any level is going to reflect uh, the properties of the majority of those dyslexics with a phonological deficit. And there's going to be some noise added by the minority who don't have that deficit. Okay, and, and so far, I mean, obviously, eventually we would want to distinguish subtypes and to study the biological basis of the distinct subtypes, and some people are beginning to do that. Uh, but because the other subtypes of dyslexia are not so well established, this is, uh, this is not the mainstream approach yet. And so we're left with studying a rather unselected group of dyslexic children. Okay, um, and so... Um, from now, I mean, I have, I have slides to show um, at the structural level, at the functional level, at the genetic level. Uh, I have chosen to, to spend at least the first hour on the structural level because for several reasons. First, that I think that, that's, where, uh, that, that's, that's where the, piece, the most exciting pieces of my data lie, uh, in my opinion. And so I want to share them with you and also because they're they're a good opportunity to discuss many other things of general interest uh, because some of my data did not turn out uh, uh, the, the way I, I expected and so that's always interesting. Uh, but then later, if you want, we can also discuss uh, uh, functional or genetic differences. Uh, although for, for those uh, things, especially for the genetic differences, uh, they, they are pretty well covered in the paper that I provided for you. So. Uh, the, that would be mostly redundant. Okay, and in fact, I also made up a number of few uh, of new slides uh, early this morning because I was inspired by the previous talks, and so there are, there will be mo mo more things to to discuss. And so, of course, feel free to ask questions and interrupt me, and interrupt me as much as needed. Okay, so um, if we discuss brain structural differences in people with dyslexia, uh, the the starting point really is the dissection studies, the post-mortem studies carried out by uh, Galaberda and Geschwind at Harvard at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. This is really the founding work of all the neuroanatomy of dyslexia and of cognitive and psychiatric disorders for that matter. They were, they were really the first ones to do uh, such significant work. Um, and so, um, so basically they, they were able and lucky enough to, to collect uh, a, a few brains of individuals who had been diagnosed uh, as dyslexic before they died, um, which was not very frequent at that time, as you can imagine. And, uh, and those people donated their brain and, and uh, then they were able to, uh, to slice them uh, just as uh, Nicolas showed yesterday and to st study them using immunochemistry and, and you, you, uh, doing precise histological studies. And so uh, a quick summary of those findings is that the, the, the main observations that they made in those brains is they, they, they found uh, so-called ectopias, microgyri, uh, dysplasias, heterotopias, which are all relatively minor disruptions. Uh, uh, of course, disle in dyslexia, if you give the MRI of a dyslexic person to a radiologist, there is nothing to see. These are perfectly normal brains, right? 
Uh, but you, if, you, if you take the microscope, there are some tiny things to see. And so these, uh, these phenomena um, reflect disruptions of neuronal migration. And so I think we've discussed neuronal migration uh, yesterday already. So, um, so this is just the, this, this stage where neurons migrate from the ventricular zone to the cortex. And in humans, this occurs between 12 and 24 weeks of gestation. Um, here's an example of an ectopia. Uh, and so here we're zooming into the more superficial layers of the cortex with the layer number one uh, that is lighter here, as you can see, and the layers two and three below. And uh, the ectopia is this dark spot here, which is a group of cell bodies of neurons uh, that are ectopic. They are located in this first layer where the, normally there are few uh, neurons. Okay, and so basically these represent a, a small group of neurons, say 50 to 100, who have uh, migrated further than they should have, according to the normal migration plan. Now, of course, this is a very tiny disruption. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's like a, a fraction of a millimeter, uh, and these are only a few, a few dozens of neurons. So you might imagine that this has relatively little functional consequence if you have one or two ectopias, and in fact, prob probably everybody has one or two ectopias here and there. Uh, that's not a big deal. But what uh, Galaberda and colleagues observed is that uh, people with dyslexia tended to have uh, many more ectopias than controls. And uh, the second interesting observation was that their uh, distribution over the cortex was not random. Uh, it seems to be uh, predominantly localized in the left hemisphere and within that hemisphere around the sylvan fissure. And so all those little black dots that you can see here uh, represent the, all the, the little abnormalities that were observed across the five brains of dyslexic individuals uh, that, that they dissected. Um, and so, interestingly, the, 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 because these are disruptions of neuronal migration, these are uh, phenomena that are precisely dated. If you see uh, uh, such, a, su su such a disruption, you know that it must have occurred at the latest at the 24th weeks uh, of gestation, which is very early in development, of course. And we, which, is, which, which, which makes an interesting difference with many other brain properties that we, we are able to measure using MRI, for example, which tend to be more plastic properties of the brain that, uh, that also reflect the, the impact of experience. Um, another observation that they made in the same brains was that the planum temporale, which is usually uh, larger on the left hemisphere, tend to, tended to be less asymmetric uh, in dyslexic individuals. We'll come back to that finding later. Now, of course, it, it, so, so, so the, these are very important discoveries. And uh, of course, it provoked uh, a big shock at the time when it was published. Uh, and these are very inspiring results, especially nowadays, because they, they, they tend to connect with uh, the genes that have been found to be associated with dyslexia that uh, may be genes that are involved in neuronal migration, and that, that provides a very neat connection. Uh, at the same time, uh, many people have been suspicious uh, of this data, and uh, in particular because uh, th th this is this represents, in fact, very little data. So you have to realize that this is based on five male brains, five dyslexic males, and three dyslexic females, compared with 10 controls. Okay, so it's a relatively small data set by the standards of today, of course. Uh, and so there's always the, the risk that uh, the, the, the observations of Galaberda and collaborators uh, might actually not generalize to the entire uh, dyslexia population. And of course, the, 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 the downside is that th there's never been any repli replication of these results. It's not that people have gathered more brains of dyslexics and studied them and failed to replicate Galaberta. It's just that nobody else ever uh, managed to do the same work. Okay, they never obtained the brains, or if they had the brains, they never wanted to do such minute work. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, as you can imagine. So there's no independent confirm confirmation. And of course, there have been zillions of MRI studies of dyslexia, uh, but they, they show different things. And they are on a different scale. And there's no way to, make a, to establish a firm 
uh, causal connection between what has been observed in the microscope and what is being observed in the MRI. So that's a bit disappointing, but uh, that's what we have. So that's the background. Now let's move on to uh, what has been observed in the MRI. Um, and so, yeah, this is just to mention that, of course, the localization of those abnormalities in left perisylvian region is pretty convenient if, if your idea is that the main cognitive deficit in dyslexia is a phonological deficit. At least it's a plausible localization. Okay, now if you survey the literature, uh, the, the MRI literature on dyslexia, it's a, it's a relatively large literature. I mean, we're talking about, say, maybe 100 studies or so. Um, mostly using MRI. Um, of course, it's, it's much smaller than, say, the literature on the MRI of autism, uh, but still it's a, it's a pretty uh, uh, strong literature. And so there are a, a number of, if you read any paper on dyslexia, uh, the, there's always a paragraph that says, it is well established that the brain basis of dyslexia is, uh, and then you name it, less gray matter in left perisylvian areas, less well-connected white matter in the left arcuate fasciculus, uh, and then some uh, results that may be m less well accepted, such as the asymmetry of the planum temporale, maybe some differences in the corpus callosum, maybe dyslexics have smaller brains. Uh, this is a bit more disputed. So when, whenever you read a review uh, on the neuroanatomy of dyslexia, there seems to be a general picture that, that seems to be well accepted by everybody. Um, and so what we did was to, I mean, I wanted to, to, to have my own go at uh, studying the neural anatomy of dyslexia, of course, trying to do a bit better than, uh, than previous studies, uh, a bit better in, in a number of ways. First, by uh, having a relatively large uh, sample compared to, to previous studies. So we, we had uh, 64 children in that study. Uh, and by using uh, imaging sequences that were really uh, state-of-the-art and very good quality. And for that matter, I was helped my, by my colleagues at Neurospin. And so we had a very good resolution and contrast T1 sequence. And we had also a, a DTI sequence with very uh, good properties. And we also had additional sequences that, uh, that we have not exploited yet. And of course, we had the DNA of those kids because they, this was part, the, the, the kids who went into the MRI were a subset of a, a much larger population uh, that was uh, part of a genetic study. Okay, and so the first thing, I mean, this is, Temporally, this is not the first thing that we did, but uh, logically, this is the first thing that, that you would do. You would do uh, a VBM analysis, right? Voxel-based morphometry. Um, and so, and indeed, that's the easiest thing to do. And that's, that's the one thing for which there, was, there were already uh, quite a number of studies that were published, and so we could build on that. Um, and so if you, if you read that literature, Again, there seems to, to, to be a kind of consensus view that indeed there are some regions in the left perisylvian areas that show less gray matter volumes in general uh, in people with dyslexia. Um, and it's interesting to see that with time, the, the description of those studies has uh, shifted slightly. This was an early review by Mark Eckert in 2004, and these are the, the, the areas highlighted in red and orange that are supposed to show less gray matter in dyslexics. This is a review by Richardson and Price in 2009. And so uh, here the, the, the clusters in red are those where the dyslexics show less gray matter and the clusters in blue where they show more gray matter than controls. Now note here that, so in, in the case of Eckert, this was a kind of qualitative review, a kind of his own synthesis of the few studies that were there at that time. In the case of Richardson and Price, they just overlaid all the, the peak clusters that had been uh, reported in all VBM studies of dyslexia, okay? And so the, this produces this general picture, again, with a, a rather widespread uh, network of regions that seem to be involved, more in the left than in the right hemisphere, and uh, largely uh, around the uh, perisylvian regions. Um, but that, that description by Richardson and Price did not uh, worry about whether those studies actually agreed with each other in terms of the localization of the gray matter differences. Uh, and as you know, in order to, to know that, you have to do a proper meta-analysis. Uh, 
Uh, and this was done only in 2012. And I suppose many people have been shocked by the results because uh, the, there were only two clusters that emerged as significant as an outcome of the meta-analysis. These two clusters uh, at the posterior end of the STS or STG. And so, the, and this was a meta-analysis based on nine studies and, and 266 participants. Um, and so th this, would, this might give the first, the first cue that, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. There are lots of studies. I mean, a, a qualitative survey of the literature tends to say that there are widespread differences, but in fact, a, a meta-analysis says slightly ot otherwise. But, well, that, that's, that was the state of the art when we, when we started. And so we did our own analysis on 64 children, and these are our brilliant results. We found nothing. <laughs> Um, oh, you belong to my <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and so we were, we were a little surprised because we thought that we had better images than anyone else and we, we thought and we were sure that we had a larger sample size than anyone else. Uh, and indeed we checked and so like if you looked at the, the, at the studies that were meta-analyzed by Richlan and collaborators, uh, the, the studies are listed in this table and the sample sizes are here. And so this is the total N and the number of dyslexics and the number of controls. And you can see that most studies are in the range of between 8 and 16 uh, participants per group. Okay? The only exception is this study where they had 32 participants per group, but in fact this was across three countries. So if you divide by the number of countries, this is relatively small as well. So this gives you the picture of what this literature uh, looks like. Uh, and so we had good reasons with a larger sample size to believe that we should be able to see more differences than the previous studies, but we found fewer. Uh, so that was a bit puzzling. Uh, well, <laughs> I had, I had uh, to, uh, um, to, to control my postdoc to, to prevent her from doing a, region, a, postdoc re, a postdoc region of interest analysis and publishing only that. I mean, as you know, this is what people always want to do, but uh, uh, we took a different approach and we thought, okay, let's add more data. So um, we, we had the opportunity of, uh, of uh, obtaining access to other data sets. Uh, first, uh, Ghislaine Dehan, my collaborator from Neurospin, she had also run a study on dyslexic children, 23 in each group, and so we added that to, uh, to our analysis. And then later, uh, my Polish postdoc went back to, to Warsaw and she ran her own study of dyslexia and she gathered MRI of 81 dyslexic kids, no, 81 dyslexic, dyslexic and control kids. Um, and then she also had access to uh, MRIs from uh, a German collaborator, Stefan Heim. Um, and so uh, at some point, Kasia uh, Jednorog, she, she decided, okay, we have a lot of data. We have 236 brains, half dyslexics, half controls across three countries. Now we should revisit the VBM analysis. So that's what she did. Um, and that's what we found. And uh, we found a single cluster that differed in terms of gray matter volume between the dyslexics and the controls, and that's in the thalamus, in the left thalamus. Um, probably, most probably, the pulvinar nucleus. Uh, some people got excited about this because they have uh, ideas about the thalamus uh, in reading and in dyslexia. And indeed, this may be a, a true result. Um, however, for me, the main result here is that we just failed to replicate everything else in the cortex. Okay, and, and for me, I mean, this, is, this was very remarkable. My collaborators found that very distressing. Um, and so at the, at, for some time, we had, a, we had an argument about what to do with this data, either leave it in the drawer or uh, try to make up a story about the thalamus. And I argued against that and said, oh, look, we, we must make a story about the null result because we're in a good position to, make a, to, to, to say that we have a, a reliable null result. And so that's what we did, and, and eventually we managed to publish it, although not, not in all the first attempts, of course. Um, now, that there's one thing that was slightly more reliable in that, in that analysis. Um, Oh yeah, I, I should mention that then, then when, when you go back again at the literature, you find out that in fact you're not alone. So uh, uh, Cyril Pernet had a, had a previous study on adult dyslexics with the largest sample size at that time, 77. Um, 
where he did not found, find any group differences. But the, this, this statement occupies one line in the paper, and then he moves on to the study of correlations with behavioral variables, which is a very legitimate to do, uh, thing to do, of course. Uh, but it's interesting. And, and he was not included in the meta-analysis for some reason. Uh, and, uh, and now, in 2015, there's a new paper uh, that it also has a very large sample size. And again, they report no, no group differences. So now we know that we are not alone. Um, and um, still, it is possible to find some correlations between some gray matter volumes. Uh, yeah, I, sh I should also emphasize that here, um, what we report is very stringently corrected for multiple comparisons. As you know, the, the, the main problem in those studies is that there are 100,000 voxels and that you have as many statistical tests and therefore you have to, to have multiple corrections. And because they are so stringent, very often you don't find anything with the, the, the normal corrections, so people tend to relax them uh, a posteriori in order to have something to report. And so here, wh when we don't relax the, 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 the corrections, the only thing that comes out is, is the thalamus. If we do relax it, then we find something else in the inferior parietal lobule. Okay, but uh, in, yeah. No. Uh, uh, of the 12 previous studies, I think only one or two reported something in the thalamus and not quite in the same region of the thalamus. So we don't know what to make of this result. I don't want to, to, to make a story out of this. Uh, well, let's see if it is replicated later. But ju just uh, yeah. what type of the mul the, the multiple comparison correction are you using at the moment? Family-wise error, 0.05. Okay, in terms of correlations, there were a few that came out. This is probably the most interesting. So here we, we did again a whole brain analysis of, uh, of regional volumes that were either positively or negatively correlated with uh, reading ability, basically. And so here, uh, in particular, you can see gray matter volume uh, in the supramarginal gyrus, the left supramarginal gyrus, which is also an interesting region for uh, language and reading. Um, which seems to be correlated with reading accuracy. Uh, in this case, positively correlated. This is the plot with both controls in dark blue and dyslexics in light blue. And you don't see much because, uh, of course, the, the variance in reading ability is much greater in the dyslexic group and the controls are all crowded here in a normal range of reading ability. Now, if you zoom only on the controls, you can see that this correlation holds only in the control group. And it's well, relatively convincing uh, in the control group. The three colors are for the three countries here. Uh, but it did not hold in the dyslexic group. And we have an, another correlation with cerebellum, a negative one this time, which again holds only in the control group. This is another puzzling thing in the, in the literature on the neuroanatomy of dyslexia, is that ten, people tend to find correlations with gray matter volume more reliably than group differences. Uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, sometimes they hold in the control group, sometimes they hold in a dyslexic group, seldom in both, and we don't know exactly why. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back later to, to this, but uh, my temporary conclusion uh, would be that either there are no gray matter volume differences between dyslexics and controls, or very few, or, or that they are very small, so small that you, you would need a, a very, very large sample sizes to, to find them. Uh, or perhaps that VBM is just not a suitable technique to study the brains of dyslexic individuals. Or maybe that it's not a suitable technique at all, which tends to be my view as well. But especially in the context of dyslexia research, you have to again realize that dyslexia is almost normality. Okay, so the brains of people with dyslexia, you wouldn't know that they are special and until you ask them to read. So they are extremely normal and so their brains must deviate from normality by very, very little. So we are by necessity after very small effect sizes and so it's no wonder that they're a bit uh, difficult to find and, uh, and that a technique that is a bit coarse like VBM is probably not well suited to find it. There was one question here first and then... Um, as reading is a very com um, complex feature, like it involves visual cues and uh, integration of different modalities. Uh, is there any clear definition of dyslexia or 
And it could be that there's a variety of patients with lots of different problems, but they all have dyslexia. But what is yeah. the definition? They can read. The, the definition is, is really in terms of reading ability relative to intellectual level. Okay, so the, the reading ability must be unexpectedly low uh, given their intellectual level and their education and so on. Uh, so, so everybody agrees on that definition. And then, of course, you are right to say that there must be some heterogeneity under, underneath. And that's, that's what I mentioned at the cognitive level. To the extent that a majority of them have a phonological deficit, I think that the heterogeneity problem is not so bad, okay? Uh, all disorders are heterogeneous. I mean, like if you do research on autism or schizophrenia, heterogeneity is a major problem. Uh, in fact, much more so than in dyslexia research. When I compare with autism and, dys and schizophrenia, I'm re relatively happy to work on dyslexia because, because we have this majority subtype with a phonological deficit, which guarantees that we, we only have a minority of subjects who introduce the noise. That, that's my view, of course. Not, not everybody may agree. There was Anne first. Yeah, I was just wondering, so if it's true that these people have this very slight deviation from normal because of some neuronal migration or some other developmental problem, then you might wonder whether there would not exist a whole host of uh, developmental disorders that we never know about because they're just invisible to us. We, we know about the dyslexics because there's this reading thing which is so hard to acquire and, and we spot them then. Sure, there may, be, there may exist a specific chess playing disability and um, we don't notice it because we don't require every child to learn to play chess. And if, if, some, if some children are taught and fail, well, we just give up because it's not so important. And, and it's the same with amusia, congenital, congenital amusia. Okay, it's the same. Uh, music, like, like writing, is a cultural, culturally defined object. And if, if we had not imposed uh, its teaching to everybody, we would not notice the people who fail. And if, we, if, if it was not socially important. So, yeah, there, there, there could be many other disabilities that we could define in this way. Yeah, the reason why I was asking is that now we're going to look at the genetic basis of dyslexia. But all the rest of the variability, we call it normal variation. So I'm just wondering whether we shouldn't also think of this normal variation of, as perhaps also having some behavioral cognitive. Yeah, absolutely. In, fa in fact, I mean, it, it, it's a debate in that literature, but pretty much everybody agrees that the, the genetic basis of dyslexia is continuous with the genetic basis of normal variation in reading ability. So it, it's all continuous. You have a, a normal distribution of reading ability. People with dyslexia are towards the tail, but the, the genetic variations behind that are largely the same. Maybe not 100% the same because it may be that some cases of dyslexia are explained by rare mutations that you don't see in a normal population, but these are like minority cases probably. Simon? Um, but uh, just to add to that, I would say that, that um, if the idea is that this is loading on uh, phonological pathways or something language related, it's not that it's an arbitrarily defined, um, you know, like the chess playing, I think, Example is, do you see what I'm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there can be a genetic basis for a disability to acquire a culturally defined object to the extent that the acquisition of this culturally defined object relies on basic cognitive functions of humans, such as oral language in this case, or vision maybe for some cases. And probably the specific chess playing ability would be underlined by some uh, uh, spatial memory problems or wh wh whatever. I don't, I don't know so much about chess playing, but again, that would, could be grounded in, uh, in some fundamental human cognitive ability. Cultural recycling. Cultural recycling, yes, as uh, Stan DeHaan phrases it. Okay, so anyway, we were convinced already before doing the, the VBM study that we had to move on to other techniques. And so uh, this is uh, surface-based morphometry rather than voxel-based morphometry. So here the idea is that uh, you, you model the surfaces of the brain, uh, the peel surface and the, the gray-white matter interface. Um, and that the, the basically the brain is better described at the level at the, the surface level than at the voxel level. And so when you have those two surfaces, you can look locally and uh, compute things like cortical thickness, 
and cortical surface, and then of course cor cortical volume in a, in a local area is the product of uh, surface and uh, thickness. And when we started, there was only one previous study on cortical thickness on dyslexia with relatively strange results, which I'm not going to, to discuss here. And so we started uh, with our, our 64 brain on cortical thickness. Again, whole brain analysis to begin with. The first thing that we observed is that on the global measure, the whole brain volume, uh, there, there was a lower brain volume and consequently a lower whole brain surface in dyslexics. Uh, and you can see the box plots here. Uh, these are the, the control boys in red here and the, compared to the dyslexic boys in red there. And the control girls in blue here and the dyslexic girls in blue there. Uh, I'm, we're, we're splitting by sex because of course there is a, a sex difference in, in brain volume as well. Uh, and we see both the sex difference in brain volume and the group difference. Uh, and this is pretty consistent, not everybody has found that, but this is pretty consistent with, let's say, about half of the studies on dyslexia. Uh, now, if you look at, if you do the whole brain analysis at all the vertices on the surface, uh, again, under proper correction for multiple tests, we didn't find any uh, uh, vertex that, uh, that survived. And then we did as wh what people do usually, we relax the threshold and we see what's underneath. Uh, and this is what's underneath with regions with greater thickness in controls in red and greater thickness in dyslexics in blue. So from there, we, have a, we had a number of different options. Uh, like many people before us, we could have pretended to have a, a prior hypothesis uh, for, let's say, this occipital temporal region and to, uh, to say, oh, this is a region of interest analysis and we focus on this and therefore we do not have to correct for the entire brain, we correct only for the surface of this region. And this would have allowed us to publish uh, this uh, uh, as a result. But we were a bit suspicious and so we thought, okay, let's look in Gislaine de Han's data uh, on the, her 46 brains, what we get with just the same whole brain analysis. And that's what we got. Again, nothing uh, surviving at the whole brain level, but when you relax the threshold at the same level as in the pr first data set, that's what we have. And as you can see, there's just no overlap between the two data sets. So all these sub-threshold would-be results uh, are probably not reliable. Um, so again, in this, case, in this case, this was a PhD student who was a bit distressed. Uh, <laughs> But then, okay, we thought, let's try, let's try something new. Uh, let's try a functionally guided approach. And so fortunately, we had, uh, we had one functional sequence in our, uh, in our MRI um, uh, design, which was uh, borrowed from the, the traditional uh, Dehan uh, visual localizer, where you flash a variety of uh, uh, visual stimuli very rapidly, uh, written words in red, uh, faces in blue, houses in green, and checkerboards in light blue. And you can see the activations here in the ventral uh, temporal occipital lobe. And again, I mean, uh, as usual, you can find the face fusiform area here in blue, most prominently on the right hemisphere, the visual word form area here in red, most prominently on the, the left hemisphere. You've got also the, 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 the area for uh, large objects and landscapes. And these are the activations in dyslexics in uh, the study of Carla Monsalvo. And the dyslexics show the same activations, except that their, their activations for visual words are weaker and they do not pass the statistical threshold, but they are their sub-threshold. Okay, so we had exactly that same sequence and uh, we use that in our own subjects in order to localize the visual word form area, this area in red, in each subject because the, the location varies slightly from subject to subject. So what we wanted was to identify in each subject the precise region which activates most for written words. And uh, you can see, I don't know if you can see it very well, all the little dots here, they're all the peaks of activation uh, for visual words for uh, different subjects. Okay? And then from that peak of activation, we drew a sphere of uh, about one centimeter radius. And, uh, and we, we uh, computed the intersection between that sphere and uh, the sheet of cortex. And so we had a kind of disk of cortex, which represented our uh, most responsive region for uh, written words. And this is the region where we redid the analysis of cortical thickness. 
And this time we did find a difference, although this was a strange difference, this was a, we had a sex group interaction. Okay, so you've got the controls on the left, the dyslexics on the right, boys in yellow and, greens, uh, and, and girls in green. And as you can see, there's a group difference only between the control girls and the dyslexic girls, but not between the control boys and the dyslexic boys. Okay, we, we, from the start we had sex in the, in the statistical model because we always thought that sex was an important factor. So we had this group sex interaction. Interesting. Shall we believe it? We don't know. So again, we looked in Carla Monsalvo's uh, uh, data because she had exactly the same data. We calculated the cortical thickness around the peak of activation for words. And we found exactly the same group sex interaction with uh, the group difference between girls, but not between boys. So we started to believe that result. And then, of course, the problem with those group differences, uh, as I said, is that most of those uh, brain properties, such as thickness, volume, and so on, are plastic. Uh, and so if you find a difference between two groups, it may be because this is the cause of the disorder of the dyslexics, but it may be also simply the consequence of their failure to acquire to read, and therefore their lack of training of their visual word form area, and so on. Okay, because of course learning to read implies a major reorganization of the visual system and visual attention and so on. And so in order to solve this chicken and egg problem, one standard uh, approach is to compare uh, the dyslexic group not only to uh, a group of children who have the same age, but also to a group of children who have the same reading ability to make sure that reading ability is equated. Okay, so then when you do that, this means that you go after uh, a, a group of control children who are younger. Okay, so say your dyslexic children are 12 years old and they read like 10 years old. Then you go for a control group who are 10 years old and who read like 10 years old. And then you compare uh, the dyslexics again, the, re uh, the, the reading age uh, control group and uh, whatever difference you observe is not attributable to the lack of reading ability. Okay? And so fortunately, Ghislaine Dehan also had a, a group of younger uh, children, and we selected two groups of children who were really well matched in reading ability. And again, uh, we found the group sex interaction with uh, the dyslexic uh, girls here, having lower cortical thickness than the reading matched control girls this time. Okay, so now we had the, the same result uh, three times in a row uh, and we thought, okay, let's believe it and let's publish it. Uh, so that, that's what we did. So, but again, uh, even, even that result probably would be worth replicating because we, we were driven to this functionally uh, guided approach by our failure to find something in the whole brain approach, right? Okay, so that's... Uh, that's the, the summary for our cortical thickness investigations. We, we found that dyslexic girls have thinner cortex in the visual world from area compared to both age-matched and to reading-matched control girls. And we replicated uh, this uh, result. And we find no such effect in boys. And we'll come back later, if you like, to uh, sex differences. Um, I wonder whether I should tell you about uh, okay, I'm going to skip uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, uh, we, we can go back to that if you really want to see the data, okay? I'd like to move on to the planum temporale, which is also uh, an interesting study. Okay, the planum temporale. Uh, that, that's nice because uh, yesterday you were given a very nice lecture on the anatomy of the temporal gyrus by Nicola. So, uh, so you know that we're looking at the temporal lobe from above here. Uh, like here, the anatomists have just cut uh, the, the, the parietal and, and frontal lobes by cutting through the sylvian fissure. So you're looking at the superior temporal plane. This is the, the planum temporale, which is just posterior of Heschel's gyrus. And Geschwin and Levitsky, a long time ago, by dissecting 100 brains, uh, had established that about two-thirds of the brain have a planum that is larger on the left hemisphere than on the right. And about one-third of the brain have relatively symmetrical planum. And so in his di dissection studies of dyslexic brains, Galaberda had found that the five male dyslexic brains that he had did not show this leftward asymmetry. They were more symmetrical. 
So he suggested that uh, a failure uh, uh, to, to have this typical leftward asymmetry of the plenum might be a risk factor for dyslexia. Now, as I said, his dissection studies were never replicated, but of course the plenum temporale can be measured using MRI uh, images, and many people attempted to do that. There's a long list of studies uh, that attempted to do that, and it's fair to say that the, the findings were quite mixed. And in fact, a majority of studies reported that they failed to replicate uh, Galaberda's observation, and that they did not see any difference in plenum asymmetry between dyslexics and controls. However, by talking to Galaberda, it surfaced that uh, he was not convinced just because other people uh, did not measure the plenum temporale in the way they did it when they did the dissections. And of course, if you measure different things, uh, it's not a real replication. It's not a, an attempt at replicating. Um, and, and he had good reasons for dissecting the plenum temporale in the way he did because he had done the, the, the histology at the microscope and he knew where the boundaries were between the Broadman areas. He had seen them under the, the microscope, so he had a good reason uh, to, to stop there, for example. Um, so I thought, okay, uh, then why, why not try and, and redo this study, uh, this dissection of the plenum temporale using modern MRI uh, imaging analysis techniques, but using the very same criteria as Galaberda, and we'll see who's right. Um, and so uh, that's what we did. Uh, and so uh, Irene Altarelli uh, was actually tutored by Al, Al Galaberda on the very precise criteria that he used to dissect the, the plenum temporale. And so here, and we used the same sort of dissection technique that, that he used uh, physically, but we did it virtually. Uh, so basically you, you, you cut through the sylvian fissure, you look at the temporal lobe here, and you can see very well Heschel's gyrus in red, the planum in blue, and the posterior ramus here in green. Um, and so the, the anterior border of the planum is not controversial, it's the, it's the transverse sulcus. Uh, the lateral border is not controversial either, uh, but the, the, the whole matter is the, where the posterior border of the planum lies. Many people have gone up to the end of the sylvian fissure, which Galaberda always said is very wrong, because as soon as there's a change in slope in the sulcus, uh, the, there's a concomitant change in, in the histology. And so he says that's, that's where you should stop. And so we followed very precisely his uh, criteria, and Irene did it on 81 right-handed subjects, and which was a major piece of work because as you, I mean, this is really manual uh, delineation, so it takes a lot of time. It took, took her several months. Uh, but at the end, we had complete data on 81 subjects, and that's what we found. The controls are on the left, and they show the, uh, the leftward asymmetry uh, described by Geschwind and Levitsky. So the, the, the surface of the planum is here on the y-axis and the left hemisphere is in red, the blue hemisphere is in green, and there, there's uh, the, the larger surface on the left hemisphere. And as you can see, the dyslexics show uh, in our data the opposite pattern with a, a, a larger uh, right planum than left. And here, uh, that's the, the group um, uh, group hemisphere interaction, yeah? Did you do observer reliability and line coding? Uh, not systematically across the 81 brains, but they did it, uh, they did it together with uh, Irene Alterelli and Fran François Leroy. They were the two, the two coders, and uh, they did that on a subset of the brains. And Galaberda was there in the background checking all the suspicious brains that were difficult to code. So and did you code line? Uh, yes, they coded blind with respect to both hemisphere and a group. Now, as you could see, this is uh, for the boys. In fact, we had a triple interaction, hemisphere by gender, uh, by diagnosis, uh, such that in the girls, you could see, again, the typical leftward asymmetry, also, although it's less pronounced in the girls than in the boys, but it does not differ between the controls and the dyslexics. Another way to see that is for each individual to categorize his or her brain into leftward, rightward, or symmetrical, uh, which is this histogram. And as you can see again, for the control males, about two-thirds have the leftward asymmetry, one-third the rightward asymmetry, and just one had a symmetrical pattern. In the dyslexics, the pattern is reversed, and in the girls, uh, it's mostly leftward. Okay. Uh, 
An interesting thing that you can do is look at the distribution. Uh, obviously, so, so here, this is quite interesting because uh, first, we know what we're measuring contrary to uh, when we're doing v VBM. And we have good reasons that we're as close as one can get to a, a real site -archi architectonic area by using MRI. Uh, secondly, this is, uh, this is a measure that is not like cortical thickness or brain volume that is less likely to be responsive to experience. In fact, the asymmetry of the plenum temporale has been described already at birth in humans and even in the fetus. So there are good reasons to think that it's, uh, that it's determined very early on and very little reason to think that it could be modified by uh, poor reading acquisition, for example. So here we, we are much more confident that this is a cause, a causal factor rather than a consequence of uh, poor reading. So we're as close as we can get to a, a real neural mar marker of dyslexia. However, we have to, to agree on what a neural marker of dyslexia is. Obviously, we, we cannot claim to have found something that is present in all dyslexics and absent in all controls. Uh, if you look at the, the asymmetry of the planum, so like right minus left divided by the sum, uh, across the groups there is a large overlap. Okay? Uh, so, so you will never be able to decide group membership only based on uh, the asymmetry of the planum. Uh, there's probably a little less overlap than, than this uh, uh, box plot uh, seems to suggest because there's only one control here. Okay, all, uh, around here there are no controls at all. Uh, of course, this holds only in the males, so let, let's for forget about the females. Just for the sake of the exercise, I wondered, okay, how well could we classify the two groups based on the asymmetry of the planum? Of course, we know it's not the right way to do it because we should do it on an independent uh, data set. But even if we do it on the very same data set on which we, we, we discovered the difference, uh, how well can we do? Uh, in, so first, the, 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 the asymmetry of the planum explains 9 to 12 percent of the variance in the, in the group difference. So it's substantial, but it's not enormous. The, the classification under best of circumstances would be, to, would be able to, to classify about two-thirds of the subject correctly in their group. However, if you do that, and that would correspond to this red line, if you do that, that would be at the, the cost of classifying 28% of the controls into the dyslexic group. And so if you, because of course, people who, who look for neural markers of dyslexia, they, they, at least in their grant proposal, they always write, this is going to be useful for early diagnosis of dyslexia. So now let's put it to the test, right? Uh, and so for, for this kind of purpose, uh, you don't want to have a high false positive rate because you, it may be okay to miss a number of dyslexics, but you don't want to get uh, controlled children into a, a whole medical pipeline that would be uh, costly and, and useless and, and traumatic and, and so on. Uh, so you want to decrease this false positive rate, so then you shift the, 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 the threshold here and you could still detect about 60% of dyslexics by lowering the false positive rate to 16%, but that's probably still too high. So you can make it even more stringent by, uh, by having only one a wrongly labeled control, that one here, and you would still detect about one third of dyslexics. Okay, so that tells you, uh, that, that gives you an idea of the discriminative power of this planum asymmetry. However, like if you're thinking in terms of public health uh, recommendations, uh, you cannot leave it at that. You also have to take into account the prevalence of dyslexia. Like if you, if you screened an unselected population, uh, and you try to classify them based on PTA symmetry, uh, given that the prevalence of dyslexia is only about 5%, what decision could you make? And in fact, uh, out of an unselected population, two-thirds of the children with the most rightward asymmetry would actually be controls. So that's where you can see that this sort of attempt at, a, at an early diagnosis by, based on a neural marker would be completely useless for practical purposes. Okay, which does not mean that it's uh, an interesting. Uh, I still think that it's the best that we have, but uh, you should not believe anybody who, say, who tells you that uh, you're going to diagnose a disorder thanks to uh, some neural marker that is uh, detected early on. Okay, um, let's see where I am. Maybe before, before the break, let me move on to uh, 
uh, some conclusions that we might draw. Okay, so there are many things that we could discuss. We could go back to the DTI. We could talk about sex differences. Uh, the one thing that I want to discuss with you is uh, the problem of the non-replication uh, of the VBM results. And so, how many of you have read this paper? Raise your hands. Not more than that? How many of you have not read this paper? Okay, quite a few. Okay, so it's worth going through this, I think. Um, so, ha how many of you have not heard about the replication crisis? Ah, okay, so that, that, not, not too many. So, so, I'm not the first one to say all these things, you know. <laughs> there, are, there are quite a few people who have realized that many uh, results that are published in the literature, in psychology, in neuroscience, in clinical research, uh, are just not replicable, okay? And there therefore are probably false positive results that are there for relatively bad reasons. One of such bad reasons is uh, the lack of statistical power. That is that most studies have been run uh, with too few subjects and therefore uh, this, did not, uh, the, this did not give many chances uh, to discover uh, the, the effects that were, that were looked for. Uh, and so so th th there, there are, there's a combination of several phenomena. If you have a very small study, you have few chances of, a, of finding a real effect unless this effect is very large. Okay, uh, so when you do find a statistically significant effect with a small group, it's likely to be a very large effect. But uh, usually large effects, uh, I mean, there are few large effects. Uh, and so if, if with a small study you find a positive finding, you're going to publish it. If you have a null result, you're not going to publish it. And so the, the literature is full of positive results based on small samples. Uh, but they have a high probability of being false positive results uh, and uh, they, they will not replicate. And so this is because uh, of the publication uh, bias that we have such a, a disproportion in, in the literature. This is to such an extent that, I mean, this has been realized long before in uh, the area of clinical trials. So uh, now people who do meta-analysis of clinical trials, they will not include into the meta-analysis any study that has fewer than 35 subjects per group, okay? And some people recommend no, no, no less than 50 subjects per group. Because uh, if you have uh, smaller samples than that, the risk that the result is a false positive is too high. And if you include too many studies that have a high risk of false positives into a meta-analysis, then you, you screw up your meta-analysis. Okay, anyway, so everybody is starting to realize that there is a problem in, in, in our literature. The geneticists have, uh, have known that for a long time and now for, if you want to publish a new gene association in a whole genome uh, study, you have to, to have a replication sample, otherwise you are not able to publish it. We're not at that level of standard in neuroscience yet, but probably we're going to move in that direction. Uh, and there, there are many, many different papers that, uh, that document this, this problem. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's been well documented in psychology. I think it's particularly acute in, in neuroimaging for se several reasons. First, we have very rich data, like 100,000 voxels. Uh, and so that means many statistical tests, that means very stringent corrections, that means uh, many people do not respect those uh, stringent corrections. On top of that, we have many degrees of freedom. You can analyze one set of images uh, in 100 different ways, depending on fine-tuning of the parameters of the pre-processing and, and many decisions that you have to make uh, during the analysis. And so if you don't find the, the expected result in using one set of parameters, it's always possible to uh, dig further and change the parameters until you find something that allows you to publish your PhD work. And of course, we know how much pressure there is to publish your PhD work. Um, here's an interesting study where they uh, document uh, the publication bias. Here, they, they've, uh, it's a kind of meta-analysis of, uh, of uh, uh, more than 100 VBM studies of uh, psychiatric disorders. And here, they plot the number of clusters that were reported to differ between the two groups. So whether, whether it's schizophrenia or language impairment or autism does not matter. The number of clusters reported to be significantly different as a function of a sample size. And so since the statistical power increases with sample size, you would expect to see 
a major increase of the number of foci reported as a function of sample size. But as you can see, there is no such major increase. It's just basically flat. And the studies that report the largest group differences are the smallest ones. And they are the ones that are never replicated. So you can take a particular result for a particular population. The first publication is based on a very small sample, reports a very large effect size. And then as uh, other studies accumulate, they have larger and larger samples and the effect sizes decreases, decreases until there is nothing left, sometimes. Uh, I've just done the same exercise for the, the literature on dyslexia VBM. Uh, do we have the same problem? I think we do. I think it's even worse. <laughs> so this is, the, the, again, the number of clusters that were reported in that paper under the most stringent uh, statistical threshold. Sometimes they report uh, two levels uh, as a function of the number of participants in the smallest group, which is usually the, most, uh, the, the best predictor of the statistical power. So our study is here. It's here because we had only 26 controls in the German uh, group. Um, and we had one cluster to report. The largest two studies uh, in terms of participants per group had none. Uh, and as you can see, all those who reported many differences are very small, have very small samples. So I think we have just the same problem. So I think I'm going to stop there or maybe open the discussion on what to do. Yeah? I was just going to say there's also a nice paper somewhere which shows that there's an inverse correlation with impact factors as well at the yeah. Nature and science have some of the, the, these really inflated... Uh, right. I, I also wanted to add the impact factor of the journal in my Excel sheet for, the, for this graph. I haven't done it yet. Another, you need another axis. It turns out that that correlates with the number of retractions. Yeah. <laughs> so, just, so there's a lovely impact factor by retraction by effect size. Uh, yeah. Yes? I was wondering what, that's, what does that mean exactly? Like. Uh, if you have a group of 10, uh, the minimum number, or if you have 100 and you find no cluster, this means that do, do not overlap, right? So what is the interpretation of the experts in the field on that respect? And should you go for a, a large a sample size and do not find anything? Or should you start, maybe you're not clustering right, right? Or, or we are not seeing the, these lights by their sub yeah, so, so basically the, the results of the largest study tells you what the upper limit of the effect size is. Basically, it tells you with that many participants, you should have 95% power to detect a difference of such a size. So if you don't find it, with that, uh, with, with that large population, you know that if there is a difference, it's going to be very small. And so if you're, if you're convinced that there must be a difference, you can have an e even larger population and try again until you find it, or you can just uh, drop it and, and say, well, no. <laughs> I mean, you, you could consider that there is a real difference, but it's so small that it's of little practical interest and we don't care about it. Yeah. Just to go down just a little further, I mean, may, and to relate back to the Galaverda uh, study from the very beginning, which is pretty interesting. So maybe we're looking at the wrong things, right? So these structural things maybe are not the right things to be looking at. So suppose you had a pretty large sample size, uh, but you had you finished at seven t, where you have laminar level resolution, right? And the claim of the Galaverda stuff is that they're laminar ectopias, and you had at least a chance in hell of seeing something. Would that, is that a path forward on the theory yes. that you stick with? It's just my current study. <laughs> I'm, I'm using the 70 MRI to try to have, well, laminar resolution. Our resolution is 0.5 millimeter isotropic, so it's not quite laminar resolution. We kind of see a gradient of signal uh, across the, the, the cortex. We don't quite see the layers. We're trying to make something of that gradient of signal, but we're not quite sure where it's getting us. We're, we're trying. And we have also a, a different type of, uh, of diffusion sequence that, that would also inform us on the cellular composition of the cortex. So we're trying, but, but we're really reaching the limits of the MRI at this stage. And but, I mean, so the, suppose you did, I mean, you were commenting rightly that no one has redone the Galaverda study in cellular, but on, you know, on the null results story that you're telling now, suppose Al had done 12 more brains, would he have also not seen 
I don't know. I, I, I think I think I, I have two different messages here. One is I, I really believe that with VBM we're not looking at the right thing. I mean, it, it's not showing us what we would like to see. So so we we, we should change techniques. And on top of that, there's the general message uh, of the, the replication crisis, the power failure, and so on, which uh, which remains even beyond VBM studies. So it's just an example to illustrate it. Shall we have the break now and the discussion on this later? Yeah, or.